break in from Here we go. Excellent. Hello, Mary. Alrighty, it's six o'clock. And we have 69 participants already in the meeting. It's so great to see everyone. Hello, Mike. Alrighty. Hello, Erin. How are you? Hello, Mary. Hi, thanks for joining us, Congress member. We are live and recording. You are right on time. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. So, Mary, how about you kick us off? Yes. So we are so excited to have you all joining us today. Thank you so much for being with us. It is such a critical time to hear from some very special speakers and such a critical moment to have this conversation. Um, I have to say, we are in this moment largely because of all of the hard work you all did to get out the boat in 2020. Um, we worked really hard. Thank to Cody, like I'm getting that. Uh, it's not Vita, going to my laptop. You excuse yourself, Aaron. Can we mute Vita? All of you said. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> make sure you're muted if you're not talking. Um, we all did a ton of work in 2020 to make sure we had a different opportunity in 2021 federally to act on climate, to advance climate justice. And the truth is, we did it. We now have really powerful leaders in the White House, in Congress and in the Senate, environmental majorities that should lay the groundwork for us to turn those ballot box victories into policy victories. And that's what we wanna talk about today is how do we turn that into policy victories? Because the truth about the climate crisis is we have the solutions. We have the policy solutions to advance racial justice, solve the climate crisis, build our economy, protect public health. That's what we have. What we're missing is the political will to do it at the rate and scale that's needed. That's what we are laser focused on at the California League of Conservation Voters. That's what the leaders you're gonna hear from today are laser focused on. And I have to say, these are some of the boldest leaders. These are the leaders that inspire me. It's not easy to run an organization that works on politics and the climate crisis, but these are the leaders that keep me going and make me really believe that with the right lawmakers in office, we can get the boldest possible equitable laws. Um, and so we're excited to have this conversation. And I wanna say part of what's really important about what's happening federally is we have this year, 2021. Next year is midterms. When elected officials are up for re-election, it is a hard year to pass big spending packages to get big, bold uh, votes through. So 2021 really is that year. In addition, we have redistricting, where all across the country, new lines are being drawn, congressionally, uh, statewide, locally. And we already know, based on some of the shifting of those lines, that a lot of states that do legislative-driven processes around redistricting are going to gerrymander those lines for anti-environmental votes. We know that. So really quickly, we could be in a tough place in 2022 with our midterms. This is the year. It has to happen in 2021. We need a bold down payment on a climate just future. And so we are gonna hear from Congress member Levin. We're gonna hear from Congress member Porter. We're gonna hear from senators 
uh, Stern and Monique Lamone. Um, and we're going to hear really what's happening uh, in the state as well. And for kind of the first time ever, the federal government is actually leading the state. The federal government has a bold plan of action. California is struggling this year to deliver on climate leadership. And so we're going to kind of hear what that would look like and what it would be like to have an American Jobs Act, an American Jobs Plan uh, that fits California and what a California Jobs Plan could look like too. So thank you so much for joining. I'm excited for you also to meet Aaron and Melissa on our team as well, who are rock stars. I'm going to hand it over to Aaron now to take us through the rest of the program. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. So basically, I'm going to talk to you guys about the American Jobs Plan. Um, so thank you for that. There we go. All right. So the American Jobs Plan is basically the Biden administration's plan to develop America's crumbling infrastructure, prioritizing equitable transition to green jobs, and it is a historic investment in climate action. This is the Biden administration's attempt to answer the question on how do we build back better. Um, and so we're gonna get into that and like what that looks like. But before we do, I just wanna talk about the ways how laws get passed really quickly and some of we have to keep in mind. So there are, of course, you can just pass straight up laws, but right now, because we only have 50 um, votes plus Kamala Harris, we have 51 votes, there is this thing called the filibuster, which does block new legislation from happening. So if we wanna do um, really big changes, we might have to abolish the filibuster in order to actually move forward. One of the other solutions is budget reconciliation. We found out that this is basically, you agree, hey, we have to all pay for you know, infrastructure. So now we have to ask how much are we paying? And then that's where the House and the Senate agree on how much they're gonna pay on something. So we're gonna talk about budget reconciliation with Mike a little bit later on. And the other thing is what we can do to like fight for climate um, justice is through executive orders. So Joe Biden actually has been signing different executive orders to roll back some of the um, Trump attacks on our climate and also to make sure that like the money that is spent federally goes more equitably, like with the Justice 40 um, executive order that mandates that 40% of all federal spending has to go to marginalized communities that are underfunded. So we're very excited about that. Um, but with all that said, my the next person who we're gonna be inviting to the screen is um, Melissa. Melissa, are you here? Hey, Melissa. Hi, everyone. All right, so Melissa, um, our, our state Senate guest here as well. Yes, I see Senator Henry Stern um, is here, and I think we just need to make him one of the panelists. Okay, um, Vida, can we make Stern a panelist? I see, I see him now. Yes. Okay. And then is Limon here? Um, I think Senator Limon might be on. Um, if if she's Senator in. Limon is also here. Yes. Okay, great. So we'll add Perfect. them in. Sign on and say hello to Mike, you guys. <laughs> How you doing, Henry? Yeah, I'm like, I'm keeping the congressman waiting here. I, uh, <laughs> I learned from you. I'm happy. I'll be the warm up act. All I know is years ago, I'd go to Sacramento and I would try to meet with different people. And Henry was probably the smartest staffer in the entire Capitol when he worked for Fran. And uh, seeing all his good work now is no surprise whatsoever. So it's great to see you. And Senator Limona, I haven't had the pleasure of... Uh, meeting you, but it is great to meet you. Likewise, very nice to meet you. So we are so excited to be joined by two incredibly strong climate champions from the California State Senate, Senators Monique Limon and Senator Henry Stern. These two are fighting on a daily basis for climate action in the California State Legislature, and both of them have passed policies that have really moved the needle on addressing the climate crisis. So thank you both for joining us to talk about the American Jobs Plan and what that means for addressing climate in California. So um, I have a couple questions for you both and I, we wanna hear from both of you. So the first question for the two of you senators is we wanna talk about our climate goals for California and what are the gaps that the American Jobs Plan can fill for the state? 
You want to jump in there, Senator? All sure. right. I'll give it. I'll give it a whirl. Um, first of all, thank you and to Mary and the whole the whole team. I, I love 111 participants uh, midday on a Thursday to want to take climate action and build back better with climate justice is pretty darn exciting. Um, but I have a feeling it had to do with uh, these incredible super friends you got here uh, in uh, Congressman Levin and Congressman Reporter. Um, happens to be that California is sort of the powerhouse for political leadership on all this, not just in, in the state, but uh, thank God for the whole country. Uh, we, we can't move the policy needle as aggressively as we need to unless, unless it's a jobs and justice first approach. And that, you know, having gone through, as the Congressman mentioned, I went through Waxman Markey uh, the last time the House moved a major piece of climate policy. I was a staffer at that time, back at the Energy and Commerce Committee. And uh, we went policy first, and then it was like, we're gonna figure out the funding allocation later. What's so smart about the American Jobs Plan and the entire strategy to me of the Biden administration and what uh, our California delegation is pushing is that it's a jobs and justice first approach that is gonna say, here's what you get for it. We can talk about the mechanics of how to get there and what kind of policy we're gonna need, but by putting infrastructure first, by putting investment in wildfire resilience and natural and working lands and in transitioning some of our oil infrastructure and cleaning up orphaned wells and building EVs and renewable energy, by investing first, you know, let's talk about the good stuff first, right? I mean, we, we, we know though that we've got to do both, right? And that policy is going to be necessary. So um, that's, that's going to be, I think, the most important thing is how not only to hold on to the, the big, bold investment plan on the climate side, but to actually drive the outcomes we want to see in terms of pollution reduction to go with it. Yeah, and I would say that to add on um, to, to that, it, it, and I would agree that uh, it has to be a transition that includes jobs and justice at the very forefront. Um, but I think that there's maybe three areas where there are still gaps, and I think we're still going to have to do more. Um, and that's around emissions, electric vehicles, and oil. Um, and I think in those three areas, you know, California um, on the emission side, we've set some pretty great, you know, goals for ourselves. And at the federal level, um, there's also some goals uh, that have been set. And so I think maybe a lot, you know, trying to find a way to uh, align those. Uh, to the higher standard, right? Um, I, I think is going to be um, one of the objectives we'll have in, in thinking about how we use this to help us. Um, when it comes to electric vehicles, that's another area where uh, the state of California um, has, you know, set some goals. Governor Newsom announced that he, you know, there was a ban of the sale of new uh, gas-powered cars by 2035. That's very ambitious. It's, you know, very forward-thinking. Um, but certainly, I think that, uh, you know, with the help of the American uh, job Jobs Act, we have a way to getting there. Um, and we hope that we'll be able to get there by the time that we need. Um, and we want to really help all of our communities uh, in thinking about how we uh, ensure that everyone is transitioning, right, uh, to greener, greener uh, you know, um, sources of energy, including with cars, which I know are so important um, for everyday folks to get to and from work. Um, but we want to do so in a way that makes sense. So I think that that will be a good partnership. And in the area of oil, um, you know, and this is an area that, that both uh, Senator Stern and myself were caught in. Um, there is just, you know, abandoning old infrastructure. And there is a projection in our state that it will cost California anywhere from 500 million to $5 billion to clean up um, this old oil infrastructure. And uh, I mean, we've struggled. Uh, we struggled. We're trying to do 5 million here, 10 million here. The governor, you know, is trying to do a bigger portion and perhaps match money from the federal government. But even with bigger numbers, um, to get to a goal of $5 billion um, is going to be very, very difficult. And I think it also begs the question for all of us is, you know, should this all be coming from taxpayer dollars, whether it's at the federal level or at the state level, or are there mechanisms that we can look at that ensure that the cleanup um, of some of this work, um, it, you know, comes from the industries that had, um, you know, that, that caused some of, some of the, the problems we have now. So I would say that those are other three areas where we are seeing that we need to really uh, think about in terms of the gaps. 
Great. And so I want to ask another question of both of you, and this is related to a letter that you both signed on to outlining some priorities. What are California's priorities, California community's priorities on climate investments from the from federal economic relief funds? So can you tell us more about that letter um, signed by you and your colleagues that was being sent to Congress? It's, it's our best attempt at articulating what a California jobs plan could look like. I think that's the most succinct way to say it. You know, every state's going to end up implementing what, the, what they do. Hopefully, they get a deal done. Sounds like the clock's ticking on, you know, this uh, having to work through the Republicans in the Senate. But I mean, whatever the plan ends up being, there's going to be a California version of this that sets the pace. And so we wanted to highlight those core investments that are going to put equity first, that are going to be forward looking, that are going to be innovative. We're talking about, you know, community resilience hubs uh, in events of wildfire and extreme heat events so that we can actually have the infrastructure locally so people aren't literally dying on our watch from climate disasters right now. Um, it's the kind of investment in EV infrastructure that Senator Lamone was just talking about to break our addiction there. It is um, trying to get some cleanup jobs done um, leverage with hopefully the industry's fair share, but um, to try to uh, move the, you know, move past oil here. I mean, that's really the, the goal. And uh, California is a petro state. We got to admit that sometimes to ourselves. Sometimes we act like we're perfect, but we consume more petroleum than any other nation on earth other than the U.S. and China. So U.S. is number one, China's number two, California, number three in petroleum consumption. So if we can break that, um, We'll be we'll be better off. But that that letter, you know, we we humbly sent it to Speaker Pelosi. But uh, you know, we have we have a lot of confidence in our congressional delegation here to like do the heavy lifting. And I will just tell you from experience what the Senator Lamont talked about partnership. When Congressman Levin, for instance, spoke up on climate disclosure and corporate accountability, he put out a statement about a month ago, and we were struggling with bills in the legislature here. Some magic happened. And all of a sudden, like, I don't know, two days later, the SEC comes out and says, here's a Biden executive order on climate disclosure and corporate accountability. So I don't, we're just going to keep sort of sending letters in and keep asking, and then magic's going to happen. But that, that, um, I, that's one example, I think, of how this California delegation can be pretty special. Ditto. And I, and I think just to, you know, to add to that, so the fund, you know, this letter really included funding for oil remediation um, for wildfire resiliency, something that, you know, both of our districts have really experienced um, in meaningful ways, specifically community hardening, distributed power, um, and landscape management, which I think are, are really important. Um, for us, um, funding for uh, ZEV charging and hydrogen refueling um, infrastructure, um, also transportation and making our communities uh, more bikeable and walkable. Um, these are some of, uh, of the, the elements that we ask for as the state of California. And certainly I think our, you know, our congressional delegation is amazing. And so what we want to do is we just want to remind folks, like, here's some of the issues we're seeing. Um, and I say this um, as these are all very specific technical issues that we've, you know, or elements that, you know, of funding that we've asked for. But we also are very, very clear um, that the money really also should be and, and we should consider investment in disadvantaged communities. Um, I, I say this coming out of 14 months that have been particularly difficult for our state, where we have seen the disparities and disadvantage to our, you know, black, brown, low income, working class, ethnically underrepresented communities. Um, in really meaningful ways in every areas. And so why do I bring this up? Because yes, we've seen the health disparities, we've seen the jobs disparities, we've seen the education disparities, but guess what? The environmental disparities are very, very real in these communities again, you know, um, as well. And there is absolutely a correlation to the fact that these communities often are the ones with the most contaminated air, water, and soil um, and are also the ones that are getting sick with COVID um, the most. And so we wanna make those connections and we wanted that to be real. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Melissa. I was just going to ask it, you know, we've got about five minutes left and I wanted to just ask it, are there any kind of closing thoughts that you wanted to leave the audience with about the opportunity here to invest in climate, addressing the climate crisis through the American Jobs Plan? Uh, I would just say I, I'm putting my faith in 
um, our California delegation to go get this work done. I, um, but we're going to be getting their back 100% and hopefully showing the way we're spending money now. So the budget proposal that we're negotiating currently has about a $12 billion climate infrastructure investment component to it. So as much as I don't want to put um, un unnecessary um, you know, expectations either out there because we're going to try to execute this mission one way or another. And we're going to end up pushing the envelope. And that has to do with industry regulations, with doubling down on our climate goals by 2030, changing the electricity market to actually bring clean energy online. So we're going to keep doing the policy work. And then we're going to, we're going to keep doing the investment side too. I just hope by showing it that there, there's some sort of national FOMO that goes on. They don't say, what are they doing out there in California? But it's more like, oh, wow, wait, I want that. I want a vibrant EV manufacturing industry and I want to know how to deal with disasters in my neighborhood so people can hold on to their insurance and I want to fix the middle class budget by giving them a way to not fill in but plug in you know so I don't know maybe we can show a bit of the path but uh but yeah I'm 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 darn optimistic about I just wake up every morning and just love opening the paper and seeing what these guys are doing so um it's a it's a hopeful time even though Monique and I are you know we're banging our heads get up against the wall. We're fighting with oil and, and some big guys out here. So there's no small ball, but we're gonna try to keep doing our part. Right, and I you know, think of the last uh, four years and what an incredible opportunity we have right now in Washington, DC to partner. Um, something that has just not been our reality um, in a really meaningful way over the last four or five years, uh, get, given you know the changes that we've seen in the administration. And when we're going from having conversations where the directive from the federal administration is telling us to grab a rake and clean our forest, um, you know, to look, now we have a real opportunity to find funding, to figure out land management, right? All of these things are so real for everyday folks. You talk to a person who's lost their home, who has been evacuated by a wildfire in California, and they will tell you that we don't take these things lightly. This is very real to us. The impact of climate change is something we're living. And so more than anything, I think my excitement is that we have a real, meaningful opportunity to partner with our federal leaders and see something that is bold and that does right for all Californians. And I think that um, you know this package really has a way to uh, manifest itself in, in, in you know in, in forms that our community will see and will be tangible to our community. So that's what I'm most excited about this plan. Thank you so much, Senator Stern and Senator Limon. Um, we're right there with you. Um, we're so, you know grateful for your leadership in the state Senate. Um, thanks for all that you do. And thank you so much for joining us. I also want to thank you guys for coming. And I want to highlight before we move on back to Mike, that um, we are so lucky to have champions in the state Senate and in our assembly fighting for y'all. But you know what? Being a Californian is about fighting for climate justice. So we need your help to make sure you're fighting for climate justice as well. If you're watching this, that means that you're passionate about our climate and about our future. So drop in the chat and our, um, our organizing team will tell you ways to get involved either by following us on social media or joining Outreach Circle. We have a lot of ways that we're gonna start organizing around the um, Joe Biden um, American Jobs Plan. And so uh, we want you involved and we need you to make this happen. So now we are ready to say goodbye to our state senators. Goodbye, you guys. Thank you, climate champions. Goodbye, Melissa. And now we're gonna chat with Mike. So yeah. Hey, Mike. <laughs> How you doing? Great to see Great. you. And, it's and so I cool. Thank, it's so cool to be around I want to thank our senators. Yeah, it's amazing to be around such great leaders. Um, you guys are the forefront minds on this. So um, what was it like hearing from them? Because I know you've seen the letter um, from them recently. What was it like hearing from them firsthand? Well, Aaron, it was great. And, uh, you know, Henry and I have uh, known each other for a long time, and he is doing incredible work. Uh, I first met Henry through uh, another dear friend, Senator Ben Allen, uh, who uh, also is a, a great uh, climate champion. And uh, I'm, I'm super excited to see uh, all the great work that they're doing, both in the, in the Senate and in the Assembly. And we stand ready to partner with them uh, any way that we can. And uh, I uh, uh, just hope that uh, many of my colleagues across the country 
uh, particularly those who come from uh, oil and gas uh, producing states or fossil fuel dependent states, uh, will just take a look at what we've been able to achieve in California uh, and uh, know that they can do it in their states as well. Uh, and uh, that's my hope. It doesn't always work out that way, Aaron. Uh, sometimes they are uh, wedded to uh, the fossil fuel industry, which uh, wields significant political clout. Uh, yeah. But uh, you have to be hopeful, you have to be optimistic. And hearing uh, Senator Stern and uh, Senator Limon gives me great hope. And being with CLCV gives me great hope. And, and for all the people I saw as everybody was getting on uh, the Zoom here, all of the uh, 49th District constituents, thank you, thank you, thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, CLCV is a phenomenal organization. Uh, they were with us from the very beginning of our first campaign, and you have been a steadfast partner straight through on into the three years now of service. And we're going to need all the help, all the support as we look to 2022, because it's going to be a tough year, a tough race. But with your help, we're going to do it. Exactly. And so I want to talk about the American Jobs Plan, folks. You know, as I said, this is um, the Biden administration's attempt to build back better. And so they're trying to make investments in our infrastructure and really redefining what infrastructure is. And so I wanted to ask you, what are some of your favorite provisions in the American Jobs Plan? What are the things that you're most excited about when we're reimagining infrastructure? Well, having been involved in uh, clean energy and sustainability for a number of years, both uh, as a lawyer and in the nonprofit world and the business world and as a policymaker, uh, I can tell you that many of the climate uh, and energy related provisions of the American Jobs Plan uh, are like a dream come true, particularly compared to where we were uh, with the Trump administration. Uh, it really uh, is an incredible turnaround and I'm grateful to President Biden, Vice President Harris, and also our great secretaries, uh, Jennifer Granholm at DOE, Deb Holland at Interior, Pete Buttigieg at Transportation, uh, Secretary Regan at the EPA, they are doing a fantastic job. And when you look at the climate and energy related provisions, there's money in there for grid modernization, money in there for our water uh, infrastructure and the energy water nexus is so important. $174 billion for electric vehicles, half a million electric vehicle chargers will be uh, built all across the United States so that you can uh, have an, an electric car and get from point A to point B just as easily as you can in an internal combustion engine car. Uh, and uh, so much else, uh, uh, provisions in there related to equity uh, and environmental justice, that 40% investment uh, that you talked about. Uh, now, this was the Biden proposal. This was back when it was a $2.2 trillion proposal. And of course, the uh, Senate came back initially with like a 500, the Republicans in the Senate came back with like a $560 billion proposal, but only about 200 and 50 billion of new money, other money that's basically being taken from COVID-19 relief in other places. And also they proposed user fees, whereas we proposed raising the corporate tax rate. Remember, it was at 35% uh, before the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and they cut it all the way down uh, to 21. The Biden administration has proposed putting it back at 28, closing loopholes, offshore uh, loopholes for multinational corporations, creating a a global minimum tax of 15%. So that's how we would pay for it, by trying to make the tax system more equitable. And unfortunately, some of my Republican friends, they are complaining about the impact of the deficit uh, or the debt that, that uh, we now have and uh, the impact that, that uh, the American Jobs Plan uh, would have on the deficit. Uh, and look, they can complain all they want. I'm worried about the debt and the deficit as well, but where were they? back in 2017 when their tax cut had a $1.9 trillion hit on the debt where 83% of the benefit went to the top 1% of taxpayers. Where were they complaining about the deficit, complaining about the debt? They claimed at the time, you can go back and Google it, Paul Ryan said, well, this will pay for itself. And it did not pay for itself. The difference, Aaron, is that these investments in infrastructure will more than pay for themselves. We are now 13th in the world in terms of our infrastructure. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, California ranks as a C minus with regard to its infrastructure, a C minus. Surely we, we can do a whole lot better than that. We shouldn't be 13th in anything. 
and we, we certainly should not have a C minus in a state like California with so much innovation and so many great minds focused on uh, the jobs of tomorrow, uh, we ought to be leading, not following the way. And with the American Jobs Plan, we can do it. It's the right thing to do environmentally. It's the right thing to do economically. Now we've just got to convince the Senate and get it to the president's desk. And with your help, we'll do it. Yeah, and so that actually brings up a really good question. Um, we, we're seeing like a lot of pushback from Republicans where they're trying to lower the amount of money that's invested in the American Jobs Plan. They're trying to strike these different provisions um, and like say, actually just fix, you know, five roads, right? You know, they're not trying to really think about the future. So when we think about that, like what is the take home message you wanna to give to our viewers about why the American Jobs Plan is so important, why it's so important that we spend, you know, the proposed amount and like really invest in this at this time? Well, the president is committed to negotiating in good faith with Senate Republicans to try to come to an agreement. But let's be clear about what has happened, what the offers and the counter offers have been. The president started at 2.2 trillion, all new money. The Republican counter offer was around 560 billion with around 250 billion in new money. The president came down to 1.7 trillion. Again, all in new money. The Republican counter offer was 928 billion, but still only about 260, 270 billion dollars of new money. So that delta, Aaron, between our side and theirs with regard to new investment, again, not uh, stealing from other pots, not saying the things that you already would have done with regard to surface transportation uh, reauthorization somehow counts as this new infrastructure investment, this new transformational historic infrastructure investment. So that's where the sides are right now. President Biden just yesterday met with Senator Capito of West Virginia and President Biden made another big concession saying that he might be willing to negotiate on the corporate tax rate. So, so far I've seen President Biden bending over backwards to try to meet uh, the Republican demands on this. And I would hope that we'd see a similar uh, desire to negotiate in good faith from the Senate Republicans. Uh, to date, frankly, we have not seen that. Secretary Buttigieg, he was on a TV this past weekend and he said, we can't wait indefinitely. I can tell you, Aaron, we're here in our districts this week and next. We go back to D.C. the following week. We better have concrete action that we can take in the month of June on infrastructure, certainly before the 4th of July, because August will come and that is a month where we're out, where we're not voting. We have to get this done uh, before the August recess. Uh, and that means that at some point we're going to have to uh, tell the Republican senators we've got to move forward and we've got to go it alone if you won't join us. Now, the wrinkle there is if we move forward on a simple majority vote using budget reconciliation, we still have to get all 50 Democrats on board. And Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema have said that as of right now, they're not ready for us to move forward with reconciliation. So if you know any friends in Arizona, in West Virginia, and they feel like calling Senator Manchin or Senator Sinema, and reminding them of the importance of getting the American Jobs Plan done and signed into law so that we can be growing those jobs uh, as quickly as we can to get through this pandemic and get the economy back to full employment. Now might be a good time to call up uh, your favorite friends in West Virginia or Arizona. Amen to that. And really quickly, before we go to our um, viewer questions, I did have a real quick question. Um, when we do think about a just transition, it seems like reforming how oil and gas companies and the leasing that we do on federal lands um, is an important part of that um, and an important part of building back better. Are, the, are there these reforms in the American Jobs Plan? Um, and if not, what should we be doing? Well, I have been working on them myself, Aaron, as a member of the House Natural Resources Committee. Uh, the good news is that we have, as the Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, uh, Deb and I sat next to each other in the last Congress on the House Natural Resources Committee. And like me, uh, she is committed to making sure that we use our public lands uh, for good and sustainable purposes, uh, not just selling them out to the highest uh, bidder in the oil and gas industry. Uh, so we move forward on a bill that would restore community input on oil and gas leasing. Uh, to the extent that that moves forward, it would uh, revise royalty rates if uh, uh, Congresswoman Porter were on, she could tell you that she has legislation in this area as well. 
And I think everybody watching knows that she has done a phenomenal job uh, keeping the uh, oil and gas companies feet to the fire uh, with regard to the royalties that they pay and uh, some of the unfairness in that system. Uh, and uh, having Katie uh, as the uh, chair of the oversight uh, committee on natural resources, the oversight subcommittee uh, is uh, absolutely fantastic. And when she brings the whiteboard even better. I love it. And Katie will be joining us a little bit later. So we have our first question um, from Kat Sheck. Hey Kat, are you on? Kat Sheck is from um, the 45th district and she has a question. Hello there. Hello, there we are. Hello Representative Levin. Um, my name is Katarina Sheck and I'm currently living in Lake Forest. Um, and first of all, thank you so much for being here and for remaining committed to solving the climate crisis. Um, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the provisions in the American Jobs Plan that will move us away from our dependence on fossil fuels in favor of greener transportation? Well, thank you. And you'd have no way of knowing this, but I was raised in Lake Forest off Lake Forest and Tribuco, and I went to Saddleback Valley schools there. So uh, you've also got a great member of Congress in Katy. Uh, there, as I mentioned before, there is a $174 billion line item in the American Jobs Plan for vehicle electrification. That would include both uh, the uh, point of sale uh, credits or, or subsidy for people that are buying electric vehicles. Uh, there are a couple of different ideas about uh, how that proposal might uh, go forward. I have one bill with Jeff Merkley called the Zero Emission Vehicles Act. It basically tracks what we're talking about in California and says that all new vehicles by 2035 uh, that are sold need to be zero emission vehicles. And the way that we get there uh, is we uh, have a standard that starts at 50% of all new car sales sold, uh, all new cars sold. And for those companies that exceed 50%, they will get credits that they can turn around and sell to the companies that aren't there yet until eventually all the companies get to 100%. So Jeff Merkley and I introduced that. Uh, Chuck Schumer has another idea, the Clean Cars for America proposal that basically uh, provides a, a rebate. You go and you turn in the keys on your internal combustion car uh, and you get a rebate. And the size of that rebate is based on obviously the condition of the car you turn in, uh, but also on whether or not the, the electric vehicle that you're getting uh, is, is manufactured domestically uh, using union labor and uh, whether the supply chain is domestic as well. We have to make sure the supply chain, the batteries and the components and the final assembly is being done in the United States as well. I am convinced and I know President Biden is convinced that 10, 20, 30 years, we're all going to be using a whole suite of different technologies to move people, to move goods, to build buildings, to generate electricity, to grow food. Certainly we're going to be driving electric vehicles. And the question we have to ask ourselves is whether those EVs and all those other technologies, whether they're going to be innovated and manufactured and scaled in the United States with American companies and American labor, or whether we're going to be using technologies that are innovated, manufactured, and scaled abroad. And if we fail to lead in this area, if we don't make the investments uh, in the electric vehicle sector, uh, we're still going to be driving EVs. They just won't be made here. And that will not only be a uh, lost environmental opportunity, but also a massive economic mistake. Why not lead in this incredible industry? And for those that say, well, Tesla didn't need government help. Well, go back and look at your history. The first uh, ARRA, the America, American Reinvestment uh, and Recovery and Reinvestment Act after the uh, 08 financial crisis, the loan guarantee program included over half a billion dollar loan to another, none other than Tesla Motors. We would not have Tesla as it stands today, but for that program. So remind your favorite Republican friend the next time they bring up uh, that Tesla didn't need any government help. Excellent, thank you so much, Kat. Um, our next question is coming from Patrick O'Shell um, and he's from your neck of the woods. Hey Patrick, come on down. Hello Patrick. All righty. There he um, is. There he is. He's coming. Excellent. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick O'Shell, and I'm from San Diego. Thank you so much, Representative, for taking the time to be here. So because water is a human right, 
ensuring access to safe and clean drinking water is vital when working toward a just transition. However, currently our water infrastructure has been underfunded nationwide, including in California, which has led to high levels of lead, PFAs, chemicals, and other toxins being found in our drinking water. So my question is, will the American Jobs Plan invest in programs to ensure clean drinking water? Well, I have really good news for you, Patrick. Yes, absolutely. In fact, it is uh, really a historic investment uh, that the Biden administration is proposing uh, in drinking water. And you're right, you know, across the country, <clears throat> we still have pipes and treatment plants that are aging and, and uh, uh, drinking water that is still in the year 2021 endangering public health. Uh, one of my dear friends in the Congress is Dan Kildee. He represents a district in Flint, Michigan. And he will tell you that here we are, years after the Flint water crisis uh, really came to national prominence, <clears throat> and it still has not been fully addressed. And the fact that we still have lead pipes in, in thousands of schools, uh, it's simply unacceptable. Uh, there are six to 10 million homes in the United States today that get their drinking water through lead pipes. Think of that, six to 10 million homes. And as we know, the CDC, public health community, when asked what is a safe level of lead exposure for children, the answer is zero, zero. So the fact that we're talking six to 10 million homes that still have lead, frankly, in the United States, it's a disgrace. We're talking about developmental problems, neurological problems, uh, and we've got to do all we can. That's why the president's going to commit 45 billion in the American Jobs Plan uh, for what's called the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund and also the WIN program, Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation. And it's going to lead, as I said, the six to 10 million homes to uh, not have lead in their pipes and the 400,000 schools as well. So that's just one part. Uh, there's about 115 billion uh, dealing with water infrastructure, and we've got to make sure that that becomes a law of the land. Uh, well, it might not directly uh, impact our district as much, although we still have our challenges as well uh, with, uh, with water, with, with stormwater and a lot of other infrastructure uh, challenges in San Diego and in Orange County. Uh, we've got to do all we can to make sure we don't have lead pipes in the United States of America. It's long past time. So I thank you for the question, Patrick. Excellent. And our next question is going to Kathleen Trusader, um, coming from Irvine. Hey, Kathleen, thank you for joining hey, us. Kathleen, how are you? Now, Kathleen ought to be the guest for this. because Kathleen she, uh, is a brilliant scientist from UC I Irvine. From her. I learned from her. Yeah. Oh, no, I learned a lot. From you. I'm learning a lot today. So um, thank you so much, Congressman, for being here. Uh, I'm Dr. Kathleen Trusader. Incidentally, I'm running for Irvine City Council. Uh, my question is, as we look at a just transition to renewable energy solutions and green jobs, how does the American Jobs Plan prioritize and center good paying union jobs and ensure we don't leave union workers behind in the new green economy? So incredibly important, Kathleen, and thank you uh, so much for the question. Thank you also uh, for uh, your desire to, to serve the public. Uh, it is not for the faint of heart, but I'm so glad to see uh, more scientists stepping up and running. Um, you know, I think that this president will go down as the most pro-worker, pro-union president that we've had in many decades. Uh, I am a member of the Congressional Labor Caucus. We're now well over 100 strong, uh, and we're doing all we can to try to fight for the working people of this country. Uh, for too long, we've had economic policies that are geared to help those at the very top at the expense of everyone else. And this president is committed uh, to doing something about it. So when you look at the jobs that will be created in the American Jobs Plan, it is really important that we're creating jobs that have good wages, collective bargaining, health care benefits, leave, all the things that uh, we take for granted sometimes, but uh, without the labor movement, we would not have things that we enjoy today. And we need to go even further. That's why in addition to the jobs plan, there's the families plan. And uh, maybe we'll have to have another one of these about the American families plan. But that uh, ability to have sick leave, we saw in 2020, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, 
one of the things that was really laid bare among all of the other problems that we had is that we realized how few people had leave, had paid leave. Uh, and we had to pass the Families First bill last year. So one of the reasons that I think we need these great union jobs is to make sure that we're taking care of our workers. And of course, we also saw the workers on the front line. We saw the uh, folks working at the grocery store uh, or uh, the people that are delivering our mail. Uh, they were bearing the brunt at the very beginning of this pandemic. Uh, they were uh, our nurses, of course, um, our first responders. And uh, we have to make sure that we're taking care of them and allowing them the right to bargain collectively uh, is an important part of that. So I know the president and the vice president uh, and uh, the majority of us in the House of Representatives, uh, and I think in the Senate too, uh, we're gonna protect the right to organize, we're gonna fight for living wages, and we're gonna fight for the working people of this country. I think that's the winning message. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, Kathleen, for joining us. Our um, last question before um, Congresswoman Porter comes on is from Beryl Lewis. Beryl, oh. are you ready to join us? Hey, hey Beryl. Beryl. Hi. How are you? Hi. It's great to see you. Great to see you as well. Um, my question is, how does the American Jobs Plan address systemic inequalities that have led some California communities not receiving the same level as investments as other communities in California? Well, it's a great question, Beryl. And what I can tell you is that the president's plan is designed from the beginning to end with equity in mind. And uh, it's not an afterthought. It's not a, a gimmick. Uh, and uh, I think it's acknowledging, among other things, that uh, in the past, a lot of the transportation investments, when you look at where freeways have been built and things like that, uh, they divided communities or they left out people who are most in need of affordable transportation. And so among all the other things in this bill, there are $20 billion for a new program to reconnect neighborhoods that have been cut off by the uh, investments that were made in the past. Uh, and also to ensure that new projects actually are increasing opportunity and advancing racial equity and environmental justice and promoting uh, affordable access. Uh, we also know that structural racism and persistent economic uh, inequity have undermined opportunity for millions and millions of workers. And a lot of that has been laid bare by the pandemic. Uh, we have to make sure that our recovery uh, from the pandemic in terms of the jobs that are created are created in communities of color and not left out. I know African-American unemployment right now is at around 9.6%. And historically, when we've had economic downturns, the African-American community has been disproportionately impacted by them. Uh, so we've got to make sure that uh, all these new jobs are creating clean energy, manufacturing, infrastructure, that they're open, that they're accessible to communities of color, to women, uh, and that uh, we are uh, building back better in the literal sense with regard to the communities that uh, stand uh, to benefit. Now, there's a lot of workforce development money in the jobs plan, about $100 billion, uh, and I think that is huge. And, and when you look at how they want to spend that money, uh, there is a, a $12 billion investment uh, for uh, a lot of individuals who have historically been left behind. Uh, there is money for formerly incarcerated individuals to get them uh, trained up. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think that that's part of what makes this administration uh, so unique uh, and so different than the one that preceded it is that focus on equity. And I see we're joined by Katie. I was just talking you up a minute ago, and I was wondering whether you're going to bring the whiteboard. Um, I think I have one here somewhere, um, but I was actually just feeling very proud of myself that I figured out how to do the virtual background. <laughs> it's so good to see you, Congresswoman Porter, and thank you so much for your question, Beryl. Um, so, hi, how are you, Congresswoman Porter? It's so good to see you. I'm doing fine, and I'm glad to be here following uh, my colleague, Mike, who has been so kind to this Congress to show me the ropes on the House Natural Resources Committee. And we are having, I think it's to say, um, a lot of fun and trying to get into some good trouble uh, protecting our planet together. Amen. Awesome. I, could not, I, I could not have a better colleague than Katie. 
And I was just saying how uh, thrilled I am that you are chairing the subcommittee, uh, overseeing the oil and gas companies. And maybe one of these days, they'll actually start showing up to the hearings and uh, you can hold them accountable. Uh, and I can't wait. <laughs> we'll get we'll get them there um, because there's some really important questions to ask, including I think very relevant to today's discussion about the American Jobs Plan. The most recent hearing we tried to have, as as uh, Congressman Levin alluded to, we wanted to get the CEOs of some of the large oil and gas companies there to tell us how just exactly how many jobs they created or saved with the huge amount of pandemic relief fund money that they took because the reality is they were actually laying people off um, from the fossil fuel industry, even as they took those taxpayer dollars. So we have a lot of questions for the oil and gas company um, about greenwashing, about how they portray themselves um, and how that contrasts with what they're actually lobbying for behind closed doors. So I think we'll get them to, to a hearing sooner, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, Mike, but I think we'll get them there and, and I look forward to questioning with you. I can't wait, sounds great. Mm -hmm. Well, that is awesome. So Katie, I have a question that I want to ask you before we move on to some other questions from the audience. And I just wanted to ask if you could speak to some of the things that you've been fighting for to protect our climate on your um, public lands committees, um, especially with the help of your whiteboard. Yes, so I serve on three subcommittees in the House Natural Resources Committee. I am the sub subcommittee mm -hmm. chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. Mm -hmm. And we, our very first mm -hmm. hearing in that committee was on the accessibility of public lands to people with disabilities. And this is another incredible area of potential job creation and job growth in terms of the design of public lands, things like trails um, and campsites, to design them to be accessible for people to, to, with disabilities is also to design them in a way that promotes conservation. So it is truly a win-win here. Um, and there's a lot of important work that we can do, particularly as we look forward to preserving more land under the 30 by 30 initiative. I also serve on the Energy and Mineral Resources Company um, with Mike. Um, and we have had a number of important hearings about ending taxpayer welfare for oil and gas companies. We have a royalty rate for leasing that has not been updated in 100 years. We have a rental rate that's too low. And, and this is the part that also really excites me, and I maybe I'm the only person in the country who gets excited about something called bonding requirements. But we have rates of bonds that these companies pay when they promise to come drill on our public land, that, they, that this money is going to be there to use to clean up the pollution if they don't. And those bonding rates are way too low. So not only do these companies pollute and violate environmental laws, but then they leave all of us holding the bag as taxpayers to clean up. So setting those bonding rates appropriately, including looking at things like the problem of orphaned wells, which are both an environmental and a potential health hazard um, and community-based hazard, uh, particularly in lower income and rural communities of color. So um, those are some of the things I've been working on. Um, and then the last committee I serve on is the National Parks and Public Lands Committee. And on that committee, I've been doing some work around um, thinking about how we can honor and uplift some of the stories about our national parks that don't always get told. So the one that I'm working on right now is trying to get a chance to meet for myself and share the story of our nation's first park rangers. They were, Buffalo, they were Buffalo soldiers. Um, oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Americans. Um, who served in the Civil War, at the end of the Civil War, were moved out west. Um, and ultimately, so Yosemite, our first national park, we didn't have any rules about how to use those public lands. Um, you know, we were a long ways from, you know, don't bring your own firewood. We were really, people were going out there and destroying Yosemite as they were trying to appreciate our first park. And the people doing the work of trying to be the first kind of enforcers and safe uh, guardians of our public lands were Black Americans. So as we think about how do we create public lands and do accessibility for all Americans, encourage diverse communities to enjoy our public lands, part of that is telling the history 
that Black Americans, for example, are a big part of the reason that we have the beauty in Yellowstone and Yosemite that we still do today. So thinking about how we can best, Jody Goose and I have been working on, my colleague from Colorado, um, whether it's a CODEL or a field hearing, a resolution, what can we do to make sure that we don't lose this amazing piece of history? Well, you just made my day because my mom is obsessed with the Buffalo Soldiers. And so now I have a new fact that she doesn't know. So, <laughs> so I'm Yes, if you go to the National Park Service and look up Sheldon Johnson, that is the name of the ranger who has almost single-handedly found and uplifted this very special part of our country's history. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. So our first question from the audience um, for you is from Gibran Him Jimenez. Gibran, um, come on down. All right, he's joining us right now. Hello. Hello, Congresswoman. My name is Gibran and I'm from Escondido, California. Uh, I come from a part of California where I've seen fires come down the hills and had to evacuate before. And all of us have seen the fires that have ravaged California over the years. So my question is, if the American Jobs Plan will be addressing wildfire prevention and natural disaster pre preparedness as infrastructure spending. Yes, thank you for your question. And you know, you're absolutely right that this is a really important concern. We no longer have a wildfire season um, in California or in many other parts of the country. Wildfires, because of climate change, um, in part along with other factors, are a year-round threat to our communities. And so the American Jobs Plan would make um, crucial infrastructure investments. This includes in thinking about things like um, water efficiency and recycling programs, tribal water settlements, dam safety, um, thinking about the Outdoor Restoration um, Force Act. So you know, part of the goal here is to empower local communities to engage in intelligent forest um, conservation that addresses the risk of wildfires. So my colleague Jared Huffman has a wonderful bill on this um, about making sure that local communities can have a little bit of flexibility in how they address wildfire. Here in Southern California, where, where you're from and where Mike's from, um, we have Chaparral, we have that low lying, fast burning, um, quick fuel. Up in Northern California and other parts, Rocky Mountain National Forest, um, they have those Douglas and fir pines. And the strategies you use for forest maintenance are very, very different. So yes, there is re um, funding for that. Um, conservation jobs are a big part of the American Jobs Plan. And conservation jobs includes trying to do what we can to make sure that our environment um, is prepared for wildfires and engaged in smart science-based wildfire management. And I really want to highlight that federal investment in our federal lands is so important for fire prevention because last year, 60, like up to 60% of the lands that were on fire were federal lands. And so even as California does its part to combat wildfires, we have to have that um, investment from the federal government to be able to protect our homes and families. And some of the other kinds of American jobs infrastructure things that Mike has focused on, for example, Congressman Levin, um, or on coastal resiliency, all of this ties together. Today, I was out touring um, the Urban Search and Rescue Task Force, which is a FEMA-funded um, initiative. It's located in the 45th Congressional District, but it, they go across California and across the country if necessary. And these were developed to deal with earthquake risk um, in the wake of the Mexico City infrastructure, but increasingly they deal with hurricanes, coastal flooding, and now wildfire. So as we think about kind of all of these things connect together, if we're deploying resources to deal with one kind of natural disaster, we will have less ready for those that can emerge more imminently and more quickly like wildfire. So they're all connected together in that disaster response, um, that disaster response network. And that actually segues us brilliantly to our next question from Ariana Romero, a UC Irvine student. Hello, my name is Ariana and I'm a college student in Irvine. I wanted to ask, because of climate change, we are seeing rising temperatures, extreme heat casualties, and longer fire seasons. Is the American Jobs Plan investing in building more climate resilient communities for our near future? 
Absolutely it is. Thank you so much, Ariana, for your question. And Zot Zot, go, uh, go anteaters. Um, but I, I want to say it absolutely is. And part of what's really terrific about the American Jobs Plan is it's it's preventing, and, and I think that we see so much of this in Congress, it's really trying to prevent a lot of the siloing that has gone on, that has said, oh, environment, that's about undeveloped lands. Um, you know, or transportation, that's about you know, roads. It's trying to connect all of these things together. So how, for instance, we make use of water um, in order to, you know, for, for um, drinking water and for residential water and for agriculture, that has a huge um, influence mm -hmm. and, a, and an effect on, for example, the kinds of water resources that we have available to fight fires or to do other things. Um, and so I think that the fact that we're wedding together infrastructure and energy, we're not treating these as two separate things. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that I, you know, Congressman Levin and I have talked about is, when you get to Congress, I think one of the things I didn't really focus on that much was this committee structure. And it's really, it's a huge part of your day. It's like homeroom in junior high. I mean, it's, if your friends are not in your homeroom, you're not gonna see them. And these committees, we have a transportation and infrastructure committee headed by the fabulous um, Peter DeFazio. And then we have an energy committee and we have a natural resource committee. And, and so these things can become very silent. One of the things President Biden has done so brilliantly in the American Jobs Plan is say to Congress, we're going to put these things together. You, all these committees can add in and can contribute and help draft this legislation, but we're not going to create this false choice between job creation and climate change. We're not going to create a false choice between doing good infrastructure projects and our environment. We can invest in infrastructure in a way that makes our, our um, environment you know, safer, protect species, these things are not necessarily inconsistent. And the forces that make that argument that these things are inconsistent, they have a very, very vested interest in the status quo. And so just because the fossil fuel industry, when it creates jobs or the kinds of infrastructure that it builds, things like oil derricks are damaging to our environment, doesn't mean that there has to be this inherent tension um, between job creation. So I think the other thing I really want to highlight for everyone about the American Jobs Plan is climate resiliency is not a top-down process, or it's not a solely top-down process. Local communities, including indigenous communities, um, rural communities, they need to have a voice in thinking about what are the ways that water and air access to recreation spaces. Um, what are the ways in which this is are, are hurting their health or limiting their ability to lead healthy, successful lives? And so part of what I think the goal is here is to set aside 40% um, um, of the money um, for clean energy and clean infrastructure investment to go to disadvantaged communities. These are the communities that have borne the brunt of pollution and they need to be the communities that are able to set our country on a path to cleaning up that pollution and preventing it from occurring again. And so that initiative, that 40% going to communities of color, I think, you know, I just want to empower everybody on here. Mike and I are working at the federal level. You know, we have our, our wonderful um, CLCV partners here at the state level. But there's also a role for every single American, including and especially our college students and our young people, um, to be engaging in what kind of local projects should we be doing. Right here, Ariana, the back bay, right the backs to the UC Irvine campus is going to change when UC Irvine develops its medical center. So how can we think about infrastructure and clean energy investment and protecting public lands in a way that lets us see that job creation? of that expanded medical campus at the same way that we're protecting our back bay. So UCI is thinking about, for example, the healing benefits of being able to locate a medical center amongst a nature preserve. And that's, that's I think, a really powerful example. That's so awesome. Thank you so much for asking the question, Ariana. And I know that Katie, you have to get ready to go. So I just wanted to ask if you had any last words you wanted to leave with us before you headed out. Oh, I just want to thank CLCV for all of the work that it does, um, you know, educating candidates as they, you know, launch and get on their, their they get, under, get their feet under them. Um, you know, Mike started his journey as a candidate as an environmentalist. I did not. I started my journey as a candidate as a consumer protection advocate. So very early on, Mike and I made a deal. 
I will not do anything about the environment without checking with you. You don't do anything about consumer protection without checking with me. Now, I think we're now in a place where we've had the opportunity to learn, to listen to our constituents, um, to work in collaboration. But the work that CLCD does, um, really connecting the democratic process, the voting um, aspect right there in your very name, to fighting for the environment is really, really important because energy money, fossil fuel money, um, they powerfully have shaped our environmental and job and infrastructure policy. And they have done it without enough of a check from the American people who are really bearing the brunt of those decisions. So really grateful to CLCB for having me and for letting me be in conversation with some of your terrific supporters tonight. Well, thank you so much for coming, Katie. It's always a blast to see you. And I'm now glad that we're all vaccinated so we can go get selfies again because I miss canvassing with you. So it was a blast. We'll be back at it and we'll be talking about the jobs plan and infrastructure and the environment. So I hope everyone takes what they learned tonight um, and think about what their next step in advocacy is because we really need you to, to keep pushing and keep raising your voices to protect our planet. And that's a great segue because if you sign up to our mailing list and follow us, we're going to be having an advocacy day on um, June 22nd and June 23rd. And we're going to be meeting with Mike Levin and Katie Porter during those times and really advocating. Um, it's going to be constituents. And that's your opportunity to really push for what you as a constituent need to see in the American jobs plan. So thank you so much, Katie, once again, for all your time. We're going to let you go and then hand it over to Mike. Thank you. Bye, Katie. See you soon. So I got to say, Mike, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for, for coming out with us um, and really just shepherding us through this whole night. Um, what did you take away from it? Well, I've got great colleagues, uh, for one. And uh, Katie Porter is amazing and really grateful for the leadership we have in Sacramento as well. Uh, and look, this is our opportunity right now with the Biden administration, with the House, the Senate. Uh, we've got to do all we can to fight for uh, progress on climate justice, fight for progress, uh, reducing our emissions. Uh, and, and look, I am asked often, what do we need to do? Do we need to reduce our uh, emissions from cars? Or do we need to build more energy efficient buildings? Do we need better uh, power generation technologies? Do we have to do more sustainable agriculture? The answer is of course, yes to everything. And we need your help to continue to advocate for all those solutions. So thank you, thank you, thank you, CLCB. So grateful to you and your members and for everybody for tuning in. Well, thank you so much, Mike. You are a champion and we're always like excited to work with you. And so we cannot wait to get some amazing things including this American Jobs Plan and have you lead the way. So thank you so much for thank being you. a champion for our public lands and everything. It really means a lot. Thank you, Aaron. Great job. Uh, now, before we all go, uh, I know Mike's got to head out, but before all the rest of y'all go, we're going to invite our um, organizing partner, Risa, up to the stage to say how you can get involved um, and really make a big lasting change in the American Jobs Plan um, before it comes up to be voted on by July 4th. Risa, are you here? Hi, I am. Thank you all so right, much, Erin. Thank you to okay. Representatives Porter and Levin, as well as Senators Limon and CERN for coming and joining us tonight. And thank you all for everybody here watching tonight for joining us as well. We all know why the American Jobs Plan is so important now. It's a bold historic policy that doesn't just address climate change, but it centers climate justice. So now we're gonna need your help to take advantage of this incredible opportunity to keep the American Jobs Plan strong, equitable, just, and for the people. One way that you can take action is by signing up for Outreach Circle, while we're, where we'll be sharing status updates and new ways to take action for climate justice every week. You can sign up at this link, and we've also dropped it in the chat for everyone joining us on Zoom or you can scan the QR code with your smartphone's camera to sign up and download the app. And if you already have the app Outreach Circle, you can find us with the code ZLM580. And we'll drop that in the chat too. Now, once you're in, you'll sign it, you'll sign, um, or you'll click View Actions, and that will prompt you to enter your email address 
And it, that'll let you finish signing up later via email. And then you'll tap or click next. And then you'll be ready to take action. We'll keep you updated every week with new ways to take action, including reaching out to your friends and family members who want to know what they can do to help the climate justice movement. And don't worry, your contacts will stay yours. We're just helping you get information to them and your data will always remain private. So if you have any questions or you need help getting started, please reach out to our organizing team. Again, my name is Risa, my pronouns are she, her, and you can reach me at Risa, R-E-S-A, at egovote.org. And you can also reach our Central Valley um, Regional Organizer, Andrew, Andrew at egovote.org, with any questions. And that's it. Thanks, Erin. Thank you so much, Risa. You are amazing. That was really fun and easy. So. Please, you guys, sign up for Outreach Circle. Um, follow us. Get ready to go to our advocacy day, which is going to be on the 22nd and 23rd of this month, so that we can really make an impact on the American Jobs Plan. And go tell your friends. Go on social media. Talk to your Starbucks baristas. Let them know how important this moment is and how we can all make a lasting change. And with that, I just want to say thank you for your time and have a great night. We'll see you later. <laughs>